Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer, Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, columnist and author, Austin Bay. Welcome, Austin and Jim. I thought we'd talk a little bit about China. There's a lot happening there. Um, They've got a lot of issues right now, right, Jim? Yes, and uh, they're basically getting worse. Uh, they spend a lot of time and effort uh, trying to conceal uh, just what's going wrong. But because they have this uh, free economy, a lot of economic information uh, is visible to the West. And uh, Western economists make the most of it. And uh, they, for example, uh, put the spotlight on the, uh, the fake data which the Chinese are now complaining about openly, uh, and the, uh, the basically the banking crisis they have. Uh, they've basically been making, well, over a trillion dollars in bad loans. Uh, this, is, this was part of the economic, you know, liberalization, uh, because the local Communist Party uh, hacks, you know, uh, leaders, had a, uh, still had control of the provinces and smaller, you know, counties. Um, and they had an incentive system whereby uh, they still had to sort of make goals, uh, you know, with free, you know, with uh, free market enterprises. And uh, what they've done over the decades is, uh, and this, again, this is no secret in China. There's been constant complaining about, you know, uh, bridges to nowhere, empty cities. I mean, literally, they built cities that can hold, you know, 40, 50, 100,000 people that are empty because it helps some local official, you know, meet his goal for, you know, uh, economic product, economic growth. Um, and that began, that Western economists began questioning a, this ha- happened in the last decade, uh, are their economic numbers accurate? And B, what, do, what else do they conceal? Because apparently the people at the very top are learning this setup at the same speed as Western economists. Uh, the Western economists, of course, have access to the same data that the Chinese senior leadership does, but they are better at auditing and, and spotting fraud. Uh, this was a problem the Russians had, the Soviets had at the end of the Soviet Union. I would hear, for example, negotiators who would, who would there was a lot of negotiating going on with the, the Russians were at the end of the Cold War. There, there were a number of notable disarmament treaties. Um, and, uh, and, and more than one occasion, they told me that the Russian delegation came over to them and quietly said, could we see your economic analysis of our economy? And so one time, I don't know whether the guy was half in the bag with booze or, or you know, just feeling uh, extremely, you know, forthright. Uh, the C- when the CIA guys asked him, he says, well, sure, we don't mind. I mean, it's part of the negotiations. It's open information. Why do you want it? He says, because it's better than our data. And the problem that came out after the Soviet Union collapse was they had no internal accounting system. Uh, not by Western standards. They really had no idea how bad it was until suddenly there was no money to pay import bills. They couldn't import the food they needed. Uh, they literally couldn't pay their bills. And so that's why, in, you know, the, uh, the military budget, you know, shrank by about 80, 90 percent in the early 1990s because, you know, when they finally did an accounting, uh, you know, they realized that we're broke worse than breath. Now, the Chinese have a similar problem, except they do have Western-style accountants. They do have auditors, but they've also got these venal local officials who are still on the quota system. This was the nemesis of the uh, all communist, you know, uh, type economies. And even with the market economy, which led to this enormous growth in the in the Chinese economy, in absolute standards, forget the, the uh, how should I put it, the phony growth, as it were, which is quite visible in many cases, um, the, uh, they basically still had quotas to meet. Uh, or it was a competition. If you wanted to get promoted, your province had to out, you know, outgrow the neighboring provinces. Um, and slowly, it dawned on the senior leadership 
was that they were building a house of cards, and the card lower cards were starting to get very weak and wobbly. Uh, and this is a nightmare that they have to face every day. Because their banking officials, again, these guys are by Western standards professionals, um, and the the private banks, as opposed to the state-run banks, you're going to get more honest opinion because a lot of the state-run banks are full of people who are what I call the currently unindicted. Um, They're hiding a massive amount of fraud and basically illegal acts that are, fortunately for them at the moment, so abstruse, you know, so arcane that a, a lot of people at the center, at the very top, they don't yet understand it. Uh, <laughs> you hear that occasionally when something blows up on Wall Street. It takes a while for you know an explanation to be simplified to the point where you can explain it to Congress. Well, it's even worse in China. And this is one of the powder cakes they're sitting on. Now, it was made worse recently by two things, which I think Austin mentioned in a recent column. One was giving up Hong Kong. The, and I've mentioned this in my coverage of China, that basically, early on I mentioned this last year, I said, they have a choice. Either they can accommodate the pro-democracy crowd, who want nothing more than for them to observe the, 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 uh, the, the deal with the British when they, when they left, it, you know, in, what, 1998, 97? 97. Uh, 97. 97. Yeah. And they've signed an agreement where... Hong Kong would operate as two systems in one country, and the second system would be the relatively honest uh, and, and you know, free uh, system, the economic and political system in Hong Kong, and it would last until 2047. And what the Chinese are, are basically saying now, they, they're enacting laws and they're saying, it, you know, point blank, that, no, we're going to cancel that. It's all going to be one China. And, of course, the Hong Kongers are very upset about this. They've been upset for, you know, going on a year now with the protest. And the protests have started up again, but it seems like a done deal. So, bingo, there goes Hong Kong, which was a tremendous economic asset, not just its own productivity, but the fact that it was a link between the Chinese economy and the Western banking system through this neutral, in effect, Hong Kong, you know, which was trusted by the West, and it was recognized by the Chinese government as part of China, the two systems. Uh, they're basically dumping the second system because, and this is something you only see in the Chinese media, it doesn't make its way into the West that often, they, there have, when the, as the Hong Kong protests went on, similar protests started breaking out in southern China. Now, in southern China, these were put down very quickly and often with a fair degree of violence, and, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands, we don't really know. People were, were stuck in jail and what have you. But the fact is, you can quiet it down, but you can't eliminate it. And that's what worries China. They're worried about under the Tiananmen. That was the 1989 massacre, which is, as far as we know, uh, you know, unleashed a one or two uh, mechanized divisions and killed about 20,000 Chinese. Um, uh, and again, it took years for the accurate numbers to come out because the Chinese always said it was only a few hundred people. Um, the, uh, the Chinese know that they are more vulnerable now than they were in 1989. In 1989, China was basically hit by the shock of all the communist governments in Eastern Europe almost simultaneously collapsing. Now, a lot of hardcore communists, or how should I say it, but semi-hardcore, took one look at that. And a lot of new people in Eastern Europe, either they were diplomats or or businessmen and what have you, um, and they realized that uh, the biggest problem in Eastern Europe was the communist government, and that the Chinese communist government, despite the economic freedom, which everybody was starting to, to prosper from in late 80s, it had only been under, it had been underway less than a decade, but already there was visible results. Um, they, uh, the Chinese uh, communist senior leadership realized uh, we have to stop this any way we can. Now, Fast forward, you know, what, what, 30 years later, and more people in China are affluent. More people in China, despite the the censorship of 
even mention in Tiananmen. It could still be mentioned in Hong Kong, and of course it got out, but you had to dig a little harder, you know, to find out, you know, what exactly happened in Tiananmen. But as the years went by, more and more people did. You simply couldn't talk about it openly in China. And of course, it was there was a sort of a, a you know a, a minor uh, industry of inventing code words before the censors figured them out, so you could discuss it on the Chinese internet. Um, and uh, uh, the government realizes that if there's another Tiananmen in Hong Kong, in other words, if they put down a a a put it down bloodily, uh, they may trigger you know uh, more violence throughout the country. Which is the, the the for Chinese dynasties for thousands of years that's been a nightmare. If something gets out of hand in one province, even before you know radio, telegraph, and internet, word would spread, and similar unrest in, in you know other uh, provinces would would light a conflagration. The last big outbreak of this, not counting the 20th century chaos, was the uh, Taiping Rebellion. Uh, in the mid 19th century, which killed, it is estimated, about 20 million people, uh, which was a much larger percentage of the population then than it is now. In fact, it was about 10% of the population. Um, and that really shook up the Chinese, and they still refer to that. Uh, that's why they're so hard on religion, because the the heart of the, or the spark of the, the Taipan Rebellion was a Chinese <clears throat> agitator who said he was the brother of Jesus Christ. And that was a little too close for comfort. Now, in the past, there have been many other religious-based, you know, uprisings. Uh, and uh, this, again, is part and parcel of any political education a, a Chinese uh, official gets, uh, you know, what to look out for. And what the Chinese are seeing now are all the classic warning signs. So, all right, they feel that they're in a position to suppress Hong Kong without a lot of bloody violence. We had Tiananmen scale massacre. But the other thing that's going on are all of the the rot. You know, it's like termites uh, in, in the in the economic infrastructure. And the most critical one is the, the, the shape the banks are in. Now, Japan had a similar situation in the 1990s. At that point, for those of us who are old enough to remember, uh, Japan was the next big thing that were going to take over the world economically. But they had built this real estate bubble, which, again, is nothing unusual. We've had our, we had our share of those in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but their banking system wasn't built uh, to handle it relatively quickly as, as we have in the United States. Uh, and they're basically still suffering from it. They're stagnating. They're also suffering from the fact that the women finally got fed up with the way they were being treated if they got married and had children. And the birth rate has been, you know, the, the population is literally declining. Uh, and they're very, they're still very, uh, very reluctant to take in uh, immigrants. Um, China is in a similar situation. Uh, and of course, you're getting a lot of news, bad news, as it were, from countries, uh, uh, you know, bordering China, where these Chinese gangsters are coming over and literally, you know, stealing women, you know, talking into, you know, hey, you can find a rich husband across the border in China. And they basically auction her off to the highest bidder. Um, because there are so many, because of the uh, the one child policy, and the fact that now there was a technology that could allow you to find out the gender of the child before it was too far along, uh, there were a lot of abortions, which again were encouraged because they had this one child policy for you know almost thirty years, uh, which managed to keep the population from exploding. Uh, and but then the Chinese realized another historical lesson which they'd never had to face before not on a large scale, whereas whenever populations become affluent, uh, women decide to have fewer children. Uh, actually, this is an ancient problem, but it was only a problem with the aristocracy. Uh, and in surviving documents, you see it again and again. The noble houses are dying out because there are no heirs. Uh, and the women had a saying, you know, one heir, one spare, and endless party. Um, now, the, uh, you know, so the Chinese are stuck with the, 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 uh, the curse of affluence, so to speak, they're cursed with the, uh, the, the fake, uh, you know, the banking scandal they created themselves, but were unable to recognize until, well, it's not too late, but it's getting there. Um, and third, 
the uh, the one golden calf they had, which was Hong Kong, they decided to kill quiet as quietly as possible, you know, with a pillow if possible, um, rather than a hammer, um, because they feel it will will spark a democratic uh, uh, uprising, a rebellion uh, throughout China, which China is more ripe for now because again they created this huge middle class. Now these are people who are willing to go along with a, you know, basically a, a fascist government, which is basically what you got. That's classic fascism, a, a dictatorship with a basically a free economy, free economic system, more or less. Um, and uh, they, they would go along with that. But even Hitler, who was the classic fascist, he paid attention to public opinion. That's why they didn't mobilize the economy on a war footing until late 1943. And that's, that sounds, people said that's incredible. They were getting hammered by late 43 and, and into 44. Well, Hitler felt it was more important to keep the people relatively happy because they were getting bombed. Their children were going off to the Eastern Front and not coming back. Um, but ultimately, Hitler decided, well, we just need more tanks, more weapons, et cetera, et cetera. So the Chinese are, are facing the same thing. Um, and uh, they have no. There's no easy solution for any of these problems. If they have a, if they have, if they have a democratic evolution rather than a revolution, which party is going to get voted out of office? Uh, there's never been a case of a communist party winning a fair election, um, and they're well aware of that. Uh, so basically, they're they, you know they got the tiger by the tail, as the old saying goes, uh, and they don't know how to deal with it. Now the Chinese leadership. Feel that they are they they are smarter. They feel they're with with some uh, you know uh, evidence uh, in their favor that they're they were smarter than the Russian communists, because the Russian communists, well Gorbachev at the end was starting to change his mind, but it was too late, uh, because even then in the late 80s the Russians were looking agog at what the Chinese were doing, and a lot of people. That was one of the reasons for his Gorbachev's perestroika. But this was what, 87, 88? It was too late. Um, and as I pointed out in my, some of my books and, of course, on strategy page, is one advantage the Chinese had, they had fewer years of communist rule. They still had a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs who had fled overseas or actually were still in China but were working in menial jobs or, or in many cases were lower ranking you know, local Communist Party officials, usually on economic matters. Um, so they could basically bring all these people back and rehabilitate them as it were. And so they had a much better chance and they succeeded in reigniting their market economy. The, uh, <clears throat> the Russians... We're just we're just going we're still going through the industrial revolution when the when the uh, when the uh, czars were the czar was overthrown and the whole economy was trashed. But even Lenin, before he died, he had the new economic program, which was basically a market economy you know, up to a certain point. Uh, but Stalin saw that as dangerous, which it may well have been in the long term, uh, and he is sorry to say we're going full communist. And, of course, something people have realized now is you never go full communist. Uh, you need a mixed system if, they, if they, you're going to have any longevity. North Koreans are learning that the hard way. Um, but, again, China has set up all these, these, these uh, infirmities. And rather than cure themselves of these diseases, they have tried to, you know, uh, work around them. And that doesn't work because the cancer, as they like to call it, you know, continues to spread. And they're eventually going to die of it. The question is, will they die quietly or in a boom? Knowing the Chinese, it will probably go, you know, quietly. I mean, that's their style. Just like we're seeing with their border wars. I mean, that's the latest thing with India. It's because of the cell phones and all the pictures being taken. You'll note that the Chinese soldiers crossing the, the Indian border and setting up camps, they don't carry weapons. They have weapons. The ones that still on, on what is on what was agreed to be, you know, Chinese territory, they're still armed. But the guys marching into India are carrying placards and flags and what have you. And basically, people they want it. If if there's going to be a fight, the Indians are going to have to start it. That's why in the latest round of fights up in Ladakh in, in the in the high uh, in the Himalayas, um, uh, the worst violence was a fist fight. 
uh, you know, brawling, uh, which the Chinese lost, which was humiliating, but they didn't escalate because they realized they got to nominally stay the good guy. They want to keep this at peace. Now, as we discovered in 2001, when you had the Chinese fighter, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, sort of intimidate a, a naval, uh, a U.S. Navy rec- electronic reconnaissance aircraft, uh, accidentally hit it, killing himself, disabling the aircraft. It landed in China, and at least they got out of that. They stripped, they, they pulled out all the, the secret data, which wasn't destroyed on the way down. Um, and we and the United States got it back in pieces when it was finally, you know, uh, given back. Uh, but the Chinese learned a very a good lesson from that. It says, if you're going to use the Chinese push strategy, in other words, to avoid a war, and that's always been a linchpin of Chinese policy. Again, for thousands of years, this is Sun Tzu and, and, and several other Chinese writers of, of you know, antiquity. Uh, they've had many Machiavellis, but they've always pointed out that the best war is one where you don't have to fight. And there are many examples throughout Chinese history of you know great victories being won without a fight. There was a lot of intimidation, maneuvering, and yada, yada. But there were a lot more bribes and a lot more making deals because nobody really wanted to fight. When there was a fight, there was usually great loss of life and economic cost as well. You know, these feudal lords in, in, in China throughout until, you know, the 20th century, their history, uh, the last thing they wanted to do was burn down their own assets. And that's what happened if there was a war. It wasn't just soldiers getting killed, but uh, whole regions would be devastated. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the especially the rice farmers, they put an enormous effort into building an elaborate elab- irrigation system. And that can be destroyed in a few weeks of, of campaigning. It could take a decade to build it back. Uh, in some parts of the world, like Iran, after the Mongols came through, they had a very elaborate uh, 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 irrigation system, which was a wonder of the world, as where well. it never did recover. It never was re- rebuilt. Um, so the Chinese have a better sense of the long-term damage uh, that an actual shooting war uh, can have. So that's what they're doing in the South China Sea. That's what they're doing out in India. They feel, hey, if they can push the Indians back, you know, a, 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 literally a few meters a year, you know, eventually they'll grab big chunks and they'll get everything they wanted, whether they have to, you know, risk a nuclear war, because that's another problem they have with India. India has nuclear weapons. Indians are reluctant to use them, but they have them, which is a bigger danger to China as far as they're concerned than it is to India. Um, so, again, uh, for China, their internal problems are, you know, literally the hidden menace. Austin, your take on all of this? <clears throat> I'm going to pick up one of the threads that uh, Jim uh, mentioned, that, and, and that was the uh, one-child policy. And Jim said there were a lot of abortions. Well, girls were aborted far more often than boys because of s- still Chinese families concentrating on having an eldest uh, eldest son. Now, you'll see various ranges uh, of figures sometimes saying, oh, it was 108 boys for every 100 girls. You'll see 120. I've even seen, and, and this was several years ago, Dan, that there were a, a, 130 males for every hundred born females. And, <clears throat> all right, they've gotten rid of the one-child policy. Interestingly enough, it largely focused on ethnic Han Chinese. Now, they're the world's largest ethnic group. How many Han Chinese are there? A billion. Uh, yeah, right at it. You see, 980, 1 billion, it's right a- a- at it. But that still leaves about 350 uh, million minority groups, ethnic minorities, uh, in China. I'll get back to the minorities. Jim and I both written about China's minority uh, issues. Uh, Ethnic tensions, racial tension, if you want to use another uh, word uh, word for it, and also the uh, Han Chinese imperialism within uh, within China. But to get back to that, uh, the surplus surplus of males. Well, they've changed it now. But Jim's already discussed the um, bride purchase trade, except it really amounts to uh, a, a slaving of a of a type. At least at the at the 
uh, worst examples of it, bride purchasing from uh, Southeast uh, Asia, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand, North Korea. And, and North Korea. Darn, darn right. Uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, that happening uh, with uh, the Turkic peoples in, in, in Central Asia, because there you get into the uh, uh, a, a starker uh, ethnic and historical division. And I'm th- thinking about what the, uh, there are about 30 million Uyghurs in Xinjiang province uh, out in uh, uh in Western China that have been heavily uh, repressed uh, over the last 30, uh, uh, 30 years. But you do have, as Jim said, uh, mentioned North Korea, and then you have the uh, Southeast Asia bri- uh, a bride purchasing, and that is indicative of the female shortage. is something that has uh, uh, plagued other countries uh, countries uh, that have social and cultural uh, stability issues. You know, I'm thinking of some of the, of the Middle East where well, polygamy by the wealthy uh, has like, one man has four wives and the poor boy has nothing except uh, uh, signing up with a, uh, a, a, an Al-Qaeda or Islamic State uh, organization to get uh, meaning and stability in his life. Uh, that's a tension within China, and it's it's one that's uh, I can't say it's neglected, but uh, you you don't see major media uh, coverage of it. But Jim talked about you know the the problem of wealth and the middle class, but that, that's I'm not quite sure how to how to put this but it's it's an incomplete middle class you've got people now they can you know great they can have apple uh iphones they can travel around they've got enough cash to be able to take a vacation in thailand my or at least they did uh, at uh, uh at one time uh, they could as as recently as january of the uh, of this year and it's not just the wealthy on the eastern uh, uh, seaboard, the, the Shanghai and, and the like, but you know, Wuhan, a central city. And that was part of what one of the things in their planning that uh, the uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, leadership that went for, uh, Jim invoked uh, Gorbachev's perestroika, but the uh, opening up of the economy, as the way Dung, Dung uh, put it, uh, is, is that it, we're going to make an effort to modernize some of their, well, their central cities and in the interior. I'm not talking about out the west, uh, west, west yet, uh, so that they could have jobs there and cut down on here's another problem. Estimates on this of how many people are, are uh, in, in this category usually run between about 80 and 120 million. So let's just say 100 million. And that's this mobile workforce of workers coming from Western China uh, and the less developed areas and some central China and going to northeastern China, the Shanghai and, and, uh, and uh, Beijing or coming to Guangdong, south, south, southeastern China, and with within China, this is you now we're t- talking about the, uh, mostly ethnic Han, but you're still not from there. If you come into Guangdong, yes, Mandarin is nominally uh, the national uh, language uh, in in, chi- in 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 China, but uh, in in southeastern China they speak various. Uh, other uh, dia, uh, dialects that at least dia- uh, verbally are uh, all but unintelligible with some of the northern and and western dialects. They can all read the same written uh, written, written script, and many people in southeastern uh, uh, China around uh, I'm I'm using Guangdong Canton as as the example of it. 
do speak uh, speak Mandarin because the the government has has uh, been <coughs> forcing that uh, on the on the uh, country for uh, roughly fifty years. Uh, there is some regional resentment from the South because per capita the wealthiest province in China is uh, Guangdong by uh, by uh, uh, almost an order of magnitude even wealthier than than uh, than uh, the wealthiest uh, cities and uh, provinces uh, uh, in the north some of the Guangdong's wealth has has to do with its immediate access to Hong Kong really just down the uh, 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 down the river but also modernized and was an, in, an industrial area and a trading area historically when one of China's uh, top uh, uh, shipping and and, and 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 trading cities can, uh, canton but I mentioned that the the issues of of regionalism though the workers who have moved in to keep the factories running, they're still not listed as citizens of that locale. They have to, and I mean, this is like a, an old si- system of the, they're listed back at their at their uh, home village, and uh, whether they're returned there or not, uh, on a regular basis. And that is something that, this, this is one of the, the uh, cultural issues within China. Uh, it's also got an economic uh, uh, Im- Im- uh, impact to it. Uh, what happens when uh, uh, the factory closes? Or what happens now? Jim's done a great job of outlining ch- uh, China's m- macroeconomic uh, uh, ish- issues. But th- this is. This is another segment of the population. Now, let's let's say it is uh, let's say eighty million, hundred a uh, hundred million. What do they do uh, with when the economy stalls? Well, this is a problem that the Chinese Communist Party is quite aware of, and they try to keep tabs on these people. They try to make sure that they go back when the factory shut there have been stories of this where the when the when the shutdowns in china over the last uh three or four months of the these uh, where do these workers go who takes care of them and i'm, I'm not saying that this is a, at, at the same level as the macro problems that uh, 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 Jim's t- uh, talking about, but you can see that there are uh, two or three steps from uh, real alienation from the system. I'm, I'm not allowed to work here anymore. I have to go back to where I was from, and there's nothing there. Uh, that's a huge problem for uh, Be- uh, Beijing. And if they shut down Hong Kong, Jim's already, I don't know whether it's a golden goose or a golden calf, Jim. It doesn't make really any difference. It's, uh, it's been a solid gold economic uh, contributor, not just to China, but to the whole, to, to the whole of the uh, world. And they appear right now, Shai does, uh, 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 on the verge of closing it down. Uh, we have read in the last uh, month or so about the number of Hong Kongers who've uh, moved on to Taiwan. And in the column I wrote this uh, uh, this week, I, I, I actually did a short tour of some of the hot spots on China's border or in its in the immediate uh, region. Uh, the, the Communist Party in Beijing is uh, uh, has a there. Their heads are exploding over the fact that Taiwan's new government is led by uh, a, a, a woman who is uh, pro-independence. And the pro-independence party, I'm not talking about autonomy, because what China says about Taiwan, uh, one China, two systems, lost province, and the like. But uh, it's, it's still the nationalist enclave that the communist didn't fully defeat in 1949 but it's evolved it's evolved it's a it's a, uh, a democracy it's wealthy free enterprise honest courts entrepreneurs it 
to, to, to be fair about it, Deng saw that going on in, in, in Taiwan. They were aware of it, even, at, even in some of the times when China's, uh, Red China is threatening to uh, in, invade the island. There's still a lot of communication, and there was trade. It was roundabout trade. It was through Hong Kong. It was through front companies. It was through some of these overseas Chinese and what you could include Hong Kong, they're, they're in enclaves uh, really uh, all over the world, but especially in the uh, uh, Pacific Basin. The co- communists knew that the nationalists were uh, succeeding as, and uh, building uh, a, not only a modern industrial society, but an information age uh, uh, economy. And now the, the, the Taiwanese don't want to have anything to do, I mean, there's a cer- certain sector there that is really pro-communist. It's it's not very big on on Taiwan, but now they don't even want to participate in the lie of one China, two systems at all. They want independence. Uh, they want to join the World Health Organization on their own. They may go and seek their own seat. And the United Nations, that would be a real trick, given that China's, uh, uh, Communist China has a, a veto on the Security Council. But uh, that is a, it's a political problem for Beijing, writ large. And their spine in, on, among the Taiwanese, as I put it in that column I wrote, it's been, it's been further stiffened by what Beijing's been doing uh, uh, to Hong Kong. Um, if we go around, I, I'll pick. I'll pick. A, Jim's already mentioned the South China Sea, and uh, the, there's the clash with the United States. Uh, okay, let's say that they really don't want to push it, though they pushed it uh, against the Philippines and uh, with their artificial islands, and also their theft of Philippine sea resources at 2016. Uh, Hague Arbitration Court uh, ruling uh, called uh, mainland uh, mainland China uh, all but called him a, th- a thief in, in terms of all the fishing uh, uh, stealing uh, fishing grounds abuse of it stealing fish and other things out of out of Filipino uh, waters and uh, same about the ter- uh, territorial uh, uh, seizure. And uh, with the fake islands that it totally intrude on the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, but they, there's the, it's the same things going on with Vietnam. Uh, 1979, Vietnam is something else we write about occasionally, and that was that very bloody and somewhat mysterious border war that lasted about a month between uh, 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 the People's Republic and. Uh, Vietnam, and the, the casualty estimates are not confirmed. Though there are plenty of there's plenty of evidence that the Chinese lost in that fracas about twenty thousand dead, maybe more. And uh, the Vietnamese army totally outclassed them. It was one of the impetus. It was an impetus for Deng to say we must, uh, in our four modernizations, we must modernize the the, mil- uh, the military. All right. So China certainly got advantages over Vietnam now in in terms of uh, weapons, modernized weapons, uh, and the like. But the Vietnamese are still uh, a, a very tough adversary. Is there going to be a war there? No. China. Uh, well, wait a minute. I'm not going to say no. China has tried to buy influence in Vietnam, but Vietnam has had it with the intrusion in the in its uh, ec- exclusive economic zone on uh, a seabed that has probably got very large natural gas to, uh, gas deposits. And China's not willing to negotiate because Vietnam offered them, said, okay, it, just say it's ours. And we'll let you develop it, and you pay us royalties. China didn't take that uh, take that deal, and that deal was was offered uh, at, covertly, semi overtly back uh, over a de- uh, over a decade ago. 
and yet there was that big clash in 2014 with a exploration dr- a drilling rig sent by uh, China into uh, uh, Vietnamese waters. So China is willing to push it a little bit to the edge. Are they doing it in India? All right, hey Jim, I, you, you said it was fist fights. Yeah, there has been fist fights. There have been stories too of of uh, Indian and Chinese soldiers hitting each other with sticks too. So you wonder what what that could uh, what that could be. But it's been uh, no gunplay. At the same time, though, why why is China probing areas that were not in dispute? And that's the thing that in the Indian media, I picked it up end of April, really first week of May, and then there's more in the, just today as we uh, as we're recording this, more reports in some of the Indian newspapers. The report today had a lot more information about what happened the first week than uh, than the initial reports I read. But they're they're probing an area that I mean the Chinese that had not been uh, in dispute. Yeah, Ladakh, they, they, that is, that's been in, in dispute. And then on the other side, uh, Docklam Plateau, that's been in, uh, in dispute. Um, the Indians have, in, in Modi and, and, and Xi Jinping had a meeting last year where they said that they were going to try to work this out uh, a- a- amicably. Well, it's been the Chinese who've been, they're, they're not behaving amicably. They're not living up to that, uh, you know, bilateral deal that was uh, supposedly agreed to by their leaders in, 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 in 2019. And then in, India looks over and says, all right, you're building that big seaport in Pakistan. That's a Navy base. Chinese, and I've pointed this out dozens of times, Jim's po- pointed this out uh, three dozen times. It's called the Indian Ocean for a reason, and China's sea lines, lines of supply from Southwest Asia and Africa run right around uh, uh, India and then uh, through the Strait of Malacca and up into the South China Sea. They know India could interdict them if they really went to war right now, uh, but they're building a Navy base in, uh, uh, in Pakistan with India's biggest, uh, uh, India's supposed major enemy. China may be India's real, uh, real major enemy, but they are probing them. And that's, that's with two nuclear armed powers. They're both huge and India still smarts over 1962, Sino-Indian War. That's where some of these disputes uh, are uh, originate because of the Chinese. Well, I can say originate. I, I, I can I can hear somebody in Beijing saying, hey, uh, uh, "Wait a minute, Bay. We we had some influence up there and you know Tibet and all." Well, remember China attacked and took Tibet in 1950. And uh, then when the Indians gave the Dalai Lama uh, up, they, they gave him a home in exile. What was that? 57, I think, or something like that. That really uh, upset Mao a great deal. But in 62, the Chinese uh, launched a sneak attack through the Indians back at the end, uh, back out of the passes, and the Chinese now dominate some of those key high passes in the Himalayas that you're now attacking down into eastern India, western India. And uh, there's, uh, that's smart. The Indians were taken aback. The Chinese did something very, very clever. They moved troops slowly into Tibet and acclimated them to the altitude. And when the Indians have responded with reserves, they're coming up from lower altitudes, and the, the Chinese soldiers had a had a physical physical advantage. advantage. I, I th- guess I'm not going to continue uh, continue the tour, but they've got a lot of of 
immediate on their border or in nearby waters, and I haven't even talked about South Korea and, and, and Japan uh, 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 issues. And a lot of it, most of it, has to do with aggressive imperialist behavior by Beijing. South China Sea being the uh, uh, key uh, example of it. Uh, troubled society? Yeah. Tiananmen Tiger, that's why I've used it uh, as, a, as a metaphor to uh, explain that uh, internal, internal problem. Jim said 20,000 were killed. Officially, it's 2,000. Yes, the communists did say it was 200. That's two followed by a lot of zeros, if, uh, it, but it, it was a massacre, a slaughter and a warning from the Communist Party. We'll let you get rich, but you knuckle under. The problem is they can try to control the Internet, but the Chinese have figured out um, if, if they want to, how to get around the Great Firewall and read Wikipedia about Tiananmen. And even if, they sh if the communists shut down Hong Kong, there's still going to be that, that problem. Because the, uh, it's, China, is, there is no free speech. Yet at the same time, there's so many people talking and there's the information porosity is uh, a fact of life in the in 2020. Digital information porosity, uh, information gets in and out. Oh, Jim, did I, did I leave anything out? <laughs> no, that paid pretty much covers it. I mean, the one thing that's missing is some way to measure the uh, how should I put it the decline. In Chinese power, I mean, you know, the uh, you know the media, and to a certain extent, you know, people in the American intelligence community, <clears throat> they depend upon FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, to increase their own budgets. So, I mean, this was this was this <laughs> this was famously exposed uh, uh, on both sides after the uh, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, a friend of mine down the CIA, well, I actually had left the CIA and become a, you know, work for an independent contractor. But anyway, he was one of the foremost uh, Russian experts, had a huge collection of Russian language books. Um, and uh, he was, uh, he, the CIA basically tasked him to hook up in Russia with uh, his his counterparts in the, uh, in you know, in, in, in analysis, analysis of, of the United States and the West. Um and he was the Russian guys were finally able to leave the country. They were came over to the United States, and they were talking freely. This was in the early nineties, um, and uh, they basically they had one thing they agreed on. And some journalists caught this and picked up and you know published it uh, that they both both sides had a uh, sort of an unspoken agreement that they would enhance the enemy's uh, capabilities as a as a mutual you know uh, benefit uh, you know deal because then they could get more money out of their own government it happened in the united states and it also happened in russia of all places where the military had a huge chunk of the, the budget but that is soon forgotten um and so the problem always remains how do you measure the relative strength of the two countries now we try and do this in strategy page but again to give a number, you know, uh, China is five, the United States is eight, whatever. Uh, it's not really, you know, it doesn't tell the whole story. Because it's not just the military, it's the economy, uh, it's the stability, it's the cohesiveness, and what have you. And uh, I think the simplest and the most accurate assessment I can give, we can give, is that the Chinese are not ascendant. They, 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 their public plan is to become the world's uh, main superpower by, you know, 2040. 2049. 2049 is yeah. the official. E economically, uh, militarily, you name it. But as as again, if, if, if I mean, uh, we're we're all three of us are old folkies. I'm the oldest. Uh, we lived through a lot of this. You know, we were basically a lot of us were in the business, as it were, at the time. So we basically saw what people were believing in, and then a few years later, what the tr actual truth was. So we we've we had this day. We've been through this dance before. So we can speak from personal experience, not just interpretation of of histories. Um, 
uh, it's an old uh, it's an old problem. And it, it got worse in the 20th century because the militaries were larger, they were more destructive, and what have you. Um, and uh, with nuclear weapons, it became even more you know, dangerous, as it were, because uh, everybody was, fought, was forced to fight in the Chinese fashion. In other words, the big guys don't come at each other you know, uh, you know, uh, as, as themselves. They basically use proxies. They use disposable cutouts, as they call them in the CIA, you know, a third party who can't theoretically be traced back, you know, to the to the real guys pulling the string and, and paying the bills. Um, and this is why the, the Russians thought Vietnam was a great you know, example of this. Uh, it did great harm to the United States. And it cost the Russians and Chinese very little. I mean, they did, it did cost them money, but uh, a fraction of what it cost the United States. Uh, Russia and China uh, basically subsidized uh, the Vietnamese with weapons, with, with personnel, uh, advisors, technicians, uh, endless supply of new equipment and what have you. And that paid off in the end. But then, of course, in the 1980s, you had Afghanistan. Surprise, surprise. Serve your right. And a lot of, a lot of Russians were saying that's one reason why the, the Soviet Empire fell. They says, well, you know, we, were, we thought ourselves so clever. We got the Americans to do Vietnam. But now they're doing to us in Afghanistan what we did to them in Vietnam. And we cannot afford it as much as the Yankees can. You know, the, you know the, the, that's something that, again, came out in the 1990s when the Russian the quants, their experts, came over and they compared notes. There was a small window when you could do that. You know, by the late 90s, the KGB was back in charge. That's when Putin took over at the end of the 90s, an ex-KGB officer and his cronies. Uh, bingo, the, the archives were, were top secret once more. But that open window... Uh, let a lot of, you know, uh, information out. Uh, and it, it confirmed a lot of, uh, you know, suspicions and what have you. But it also confirmed that this, this cycle, historical cycle, goes on and on. And the Chinese are the next victims. Of course, so is the United States. We've been spending enormous quantities of money on, uh, on, on the military uh, and getting, you know, questionable returns on it because the military becomes, the military and the, and the supporting uh, industries become less efficient, more corrupt. Uh, again, we write about this a lot. Al Nofri, our naval history expert, <laughs> don't get him going on the on the decline of of, uh, of uh, naval shipbuilding in the United States. I mean, he has littoral combat ships. So. Well, one of many, you know, the uh, uh, the Zumwalt destroyers, the uh, the Sea Wolf uh, submarine, uh, the Ford carriers. But anyway, the um, whereas the Chinese who are new to the business. And haven't learned how to be as corrupt as as we have, um, are turning out you know dozens of major warships a uh, uh, a year. In fact, this year, the Chinese Navy will have more warships than the U.S. Navy. Now, we still have them on tonnage. Uh, our our crews and a lot of our systems are probably more reliable. Uh, again, there a lot of them are battle proven, as it were. But of course, the Chinese are stealing that technology as quick as they can. The one thing they can't steal is the experienced crews, but you can buy that, and that's what they're doing. Their ships are spending a lot more time at sea. As time went back from in the 80s, they really went to sea. There were jokes about, not really jokes, but actual incidents where their submarines would go out and then they have to be towed back to port. The Russians were doing that right to the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, but you know, the Chinese are quick learners. And they basically learned about the importance of pilot flight time, you know, combat pilot flight time. Uh, they copied our national training center, our realistic training system. We started in the 80s out west uh, and several other places. Uh, they, they, they basically re, re, uh, recreated our, our red flag. But mainly, they let their, their, fighter, their combat pilots fly more often. That's where you get the experience. Uh, that avoids the fiascos like happened in 2001, where this basically this this one uh, Chinese fighter pilot uh, had more. He was bolder than he was than he, than he should have been because he tried to maneuver and it failed and it got him killed. Uh, and uh, it, the, uh, the 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 Chinese learn from that as well. They they basically look at the records and the, and the flight time and the skill levels and what have you. And they realized they had to improve the skill level of their pilots. And so they're now they're building whole new generations of, of Western-style aircraft that are more durable. They can basically 
be up in the air two or three hundred hours a year. Uh, and, and every hour, one of these combat aircraft spends in the air is hideously expensive. These things basically burn up spare parts as, as much as fuel. Things wear out. Um, the Russian style of, of combat aircraft were basically built for very little air training, but to be able to basically uh, go for a few days or a few weeks in, in wartime. They learned that in World War II. They built high-performance aircraft uh, but their crews never survived. Their pilots never survived long enough to build up as much experience as the, as the Germans had. And so the Chinese learn from all this. And it'll take them time. But the problem is they're building it on a very shaky economic uh, foundation. And this is finally coming home to them. And they've also got the political problem. I mean, we have our political problems in the West, but that's the advantage of a democracy. Uh, as, as Churchill pointed out, democracies always do the right thing, usually after they've tried everything else. Uh, the Russians don't have, the Chinese don't have that luxury. Uh, in order to maintain their their, uh, their dictatorships, you know, reputation for impotence, you know, omnipotence, um, they have to basically never make a mistake. Uh, or never admit to a mistake. That's why this whole thing with the Wuhan virus, uh, they're, 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 they're constantly, you know, uh, grinding the wheels on their disinformation, their propaganda system, trying to, trying to blame it on the United States. And that's, that's a lie too far. I mean, most Chinese don't believe that. Uh, and indeed, Chinese pay more attention to the ongoing uh, uh, cases of and deaths from uh, the, the COVID-19 inside China. And in China, you know, recently, uh, in the last month, for the first time since the COVID breakout, they said we had no deaths today. Nobody in China believes that. There may be politicians just- in the West who do, but nobody in China does. And as Austin pointed out, there are a lot of Chinese uh, workers who not just don't have, don't have the right status, uh, you know, uh, how should I put it, uh, uh, political, not political, economic, you know, legal status uh, to be working in these shutdown factories. But a lot of the workers who do are refusing to go back or they're not basically working as hard as they used to. Now, this is a problem that eventually will bubble to the surface and it'll become too obvious to ignore, which uh, many in the West are trying to do. Say, well, say the Chinese dealt with it. They did this, they did that. All sorts of inventions uh, in the media about what the Chinese did. What the Chinese did was they missed it from the beginning because local officials were basically promoted by not having another breakout of SARS. That was the last, you know, 2013. And, and several other before that. Uh, they had the whole infrastructure in place. They had bribed the World Health Organization to agree with whatever they said they had, which they didn't have. Um, and then when it, when it basically got out of hand, uh, eventually they fell back on the fact, well, some American soldiers who came in, in late, uh, in late uh, 2020, uh, 2019 for a, a competition, they must have had it and, and spread it to us. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, the Chinese could see that there were Chinese doctors saying, you know, in December, early December, even November, it turned out uh, that we have a new, a new uh, you know, uh, uh, dangerous virus, a new SARS. And we must do something. Local officials, it was like the Chernobyl. I mean, there was that, was a TV show where there, apparently there was a great scene where the local communist officials got together and said secrecy is more important than lives or whatever. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim, before we wind up, I want to make a comment about what you just said. All yeah. right, about, about it. You, you were saying, how do we measure Chinese decline? And you're looking at it you know, in a way like, you know, quantitatively so it could be it could be modeled. Easy to understand. No, no, I'm talking about easy to understand. Modeling. Yeah, oh, sure. Or are easy explaining. You know, easier to explain. Fine. But uh, here's here are two things that have damaged them. Their propaganda, as you said, it was a lie too far. Their propaganda has gone too far. Not only do they internally know they're lying, but around the world, disbelief of anything coming out of Beijing is. Uh, rampant. It may be not, as you said, among certain politicians, no, and certain news media, but it is. It's deep, and their uh, people uh, everywhere are suspicious of, of them because of the uh, of the pandemic. Secondly, 
And now this, the roots of this, it's, it's slower, but it's happening here in the United States and starting to happen in Europe. And that is all of the sympathizers, students, in some cases, um, <clears throat> co-opted individuals, other cases, agents that have engaged in this massive theft of intellectual property as well as in influence operations. In, it's, it's not just in the United States and, and, and Canada, but the United States and Canada were, uh, and Australia, I should say that too, real targets. Singapore has been a, uh, a, 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 a target. Western Europe, yes, but uh, I don't go with the U.S. and, and Canada as their uh, primary uh, uh, t- uh, targets for the uh, intellectual property uh, uh, theft operation, and also the influence operation. Those have been damaged. We've been damaged by the intellectual property theft, and you've written about it. I mean, you, you've got a, a deep grasp of a lot of the things that they have, uh, have uh, that the, 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 the China stole from the United States. I've covered a lot of the medical-related and in part because I uh, have excellent contacts in, in several ma- major medical research I- I- institutes, yeah, four or five around the, around the country who were just, their jaws dropped when the FBI uh, hit MD Anderson and, and uh, Emory University uh, la- uh, last year and how, how, how deep the infiltration had been and theft of really it's it's not defense related it's it's it was related to medical methods uh, not necessarily medical t- uh, technology but it it suddenly turned around it, it turned a lot of, uh, of 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 people around and said we have a problem here and the National Institute of Health, but this is also going on in other uh, uh, agencies uh, here here in the United States, going back through all of these university grants and finding instances where, where people, organizations, legitimate ones, applied for money, didn't say that they also received X thousands, hundred thousands, and in a couple of cases, several million dollars of money from China, and uh, that happened. Uh, I think the multi-million on the example is uh, one of a, a, a professor at Harvard. Now, yeah, they got a lot out of it, but they're losing that. They're losing that war, and it is uh, it, it is a war. Then they've created something where it's outright suspicion, uh, and deservedly so. Uh, I don't know quite how you measure that. But at some point, you have to, I think, or at least recognize that that's a, it was a factor in their ascendancy, and it's going to uh, play a role in their decline. Well, <clears throat> we're way over time, and uh, we, I think we've covered it all. So we will talk to you gentlemen next time. Indeed. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.